Man, so I'm going to preach a sermon uh, this morning on the topic of God's revelations, God's different revelations to man, and the means by which God has revealed himself to man um, throughout time. And hopefully what this will do is help us to develop an appreciation for the revelation that we have in the Scripture, in the Bible. Because God, as we're going to see this morning, has gone to great lengths to reveal himself to mankind and to us as believers. And the first thing I want to look at when it comes to this topic of God's revelation to man is the fact that he has revealed himself to all men. You know, God has revealed himself to all men, the Bible says, and the way that he's done that is through the natural world, through the means of creation. You're there in Psalms uh, chapter 19. Uh, we're going to be... Uh, Let's just begin reading there in Psalms chapter 9. Actually, are you, what am I got going on here? I tried, I'm doing something different with the notes. Bear with me. Psalms chapter 19. Yeah, Psalms chapter 19. The, the Bible says there, uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, con, uh, con, uh, excuse me, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I'm sorry, verse 1 is where I'm, I'm going to come back to that. That's where I'm getting confused. Psalms, Psalms 19, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So right there we see in verse 1 that God has uh, declared his glory in the heavens through creation, through the means of creation. God has made himself known. He has manifest himself to all men. If you would uh, go over to Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter number 8. Psalms chapter number 8. The Bible says in Psalms 104, O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. You know, man looks around and he sees the glory of the firmament. He sees uh, the earth that is full of the, the riches that God has put in it. And what that is, is God revealing himself to man. You know, man can't sit back and say, well, I didn't know there was, there, there was a God. It just didn't look, when I looked around, it just appeared to me as if this all happened by accident. You know, that's a lie that people tell themselves. That's not the truth. When we look around and we see creation, we see what God has made, what we're looking at is the fact that God has revealed himself to all of mankind, to everybody. <clears throat> the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out the heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? That's a question. Who's done all these things? Who's, you know, meted out the heavens with a span? Who's comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure? You know, who's measured all the, all the dust of the earth? The question, that's a question. And the way the scales, uh, the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Well, God has. God's the one that knows exactly how much of everything there is in the earth. He said in verse 26, Lift up your eyes on high and behold who hath created these things. You know, God is the one that has created all these things. He's the one that's created the heavens and, and stretched them out and measured them with a span. He's the one that has, uh, you know, comprehended the earth in the, dust, in the dust of the earth. He's the one that's weighed out the mountains and the hills. It's God that's done all these things. And Isaiah is telling these people to lift up their eyes on high and behold who hath created these things that bringeth out the host by their number. He's talking about the stars. Again, how the, 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 the firmaments, show the handiwork of God. They declare his glory. It's creation that does it. In Acts chapter 14, the Bible says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good. And of course, this is Paul speaking to a bunch of Gentiles. This is him speaking to a bunch of unsaved heathens. And he's saying to them that God has not left himself without witness, for that he did good and gave us rain. Again, he's speaking to the unsaved. He's saying, look, God gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our heart with food and gladness you know the bounty of the earth the the fruitful seasons all the things that God has provided you know the bible says that uh, Jesus said that he has made causes the rain to 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 fall upon the just and the unjust you know he does this for everybody god has revealed himself to all men through creation you're there in psalms chapter 8 look at verse 1 o lord our lord how excellent is thy name in all in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens you know, God's name isn't just excellent to those that have acknowledged him. It's, his name is excellent in all the earth because he has set his glory above the heavens. Man is without excuse when he looks up and sees the glory of God. So one way that God has revealed himself to all men is through creation. Another way that he has done that is through the means of history. 
Okay, and I'm just going to touch on this briefly, but go over to Psalms chapter 9. Psalms chapter 9. You know, even, you know, of course, we don't put our faith in any of these things. We don't, we're not saved, and we'll see that it's, it's insufficient to get somebody saved, these things. But this, the fact is, is that God has revealed himself through creation. God has revealed himself through even a historical record in the, forms, uh, in the form of, like, archaeology. You know, there are things that people find out there that validate, uh, you know, for the unbelieving world, the things that the Scripture records. The, 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 the different things that took place with the patriarchs and all that, all that history. There's people that look at the, the biblical record, they look at the physical evidence in archaeology and say, well, it lines up. And of course, at the end of the day, you know, if we see something, there's a discrepancy in the, in the archaeological record, the Bible trumps that because we believe these things by faith. People can look at things like, uh, you know, the evidence of the flood. You know, it's out there. There's evidence that there was a great flood. I mean, we've got it right here in our state, you know, the Grand Canyon State, right? That's that the flood is what made that, you know, and there's whole creation seminars and whole creationists is devoted, uh, have devoted whole lectures to that one topic. I'm not going to go on and on about that, but that is one, you know, archaeological uh, piece of evidence, you know, in the natural world that shows us that God is known through the historical record. People can look at, uh, you know, I remember seeing a video where they showed, uh, you know, uh, and of course, it's all, you know, secondhand, whether or not it's true, it looked true at the time, and if they faked it, they did a pretty good job, because it was back in the 90s or whatever, where they actually went over to the, you know, uh, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba over there by Saudi Arabia, where they, you know, does anyone know what I'm talking about? The Gulf of Aqaba, it's part of the Red Sea, it's a little inlet from the Red Sea, it would have been considered the Red Sea back then, and it's the one place in that whole body of water there that anybody could have crossed over. And they start to find these, you know, uh, Egyptian chariot wheels and things like that. It's like, oh, this is where uh, they crossed the, the Red Sea. I mean, it's right there. But, you know, you could show that to somebody and still walk away and say, oh, I don't believe it. It's all a hoax, right? But it's there. God's re- He has revealed himself. These things have happened. Look at Psalms chapter 9, verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. How is the Lord known this morning? It's not just through... Uh, you know, the, 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 the natural world, the things where God has displayed himself in creation, which is a testimony of his glory. But it's also through the fact that he has executed judgment upon the earth. I mean, that's what the flood is. That's what Pharaoh's army is. It's, you look at that and you say, oh, that's God judging the earth. That's God judging people. That there is a God in heaven and that he does judge mankind. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. That's how he's known. Go over to Romans chapter number two, Romans chapter number two. So God has known, God has revealed himself this morning through the natural world. God has revealed himself through the judgments that he's performed through, and we can see evidence of that even today. But even if we didn't have all that, even if we didn't have those things, and even if that wasn't good enough for people, you know, God has still revealed himself through the means of people's own conscience. People's own conscience is testimony of the fact that there is a God. The fact that people can just naturally know the difference between right and wrong, but the fact that they have a moral compass. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, uh, thou art an excusable man whomsoever thou judgest. Actually, I'm sorry, jump down to verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And this isn't really kind of a, I'm just thinking about this as I'm going. You know, it says there in thir- verse 13 that the, the hearers of the Lord, uh, that not the hearers of the law are justified before God. Because people always bring this up. Like, well, is it really fair that people go to hell if they've never heard? Well, hearing is not what justifies you. That's what he's saying. The hearers of the law are, are, uh, are the hear- for not the hearers of the law are justified before God, but the doers of the law. You know, the, what condemns a man is the fact that he's a sinner, not that he hasn't heard the law. And why is that? Because it says in verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves, the Bible says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts and their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts excuse, accusing, or else, ex, accusing or else excusing one another. Look, the Gentiles who have not the law have the witness of God written in their hearts testifying to them that what they do is wrong. It's either excusing or accusing one another. They either look at what some other heathen does and says that's right or that's wrong. They don't need the law to do that. And that's what condemns them. So God has revealed himself to all men through various means. He has revealed himself through 
uh, creation. He has revealed himself through the judgments that are done on the earth. He has revealed himself even through man's own conscience. <clears throat> Look at Romans chapter 1. I mean, that's, that's what Romans chapter 1. You didn't think we were not going to go to Romans chapter 1 the first Sunday in Pride Month, did you? Romans chapter 1, it says there in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, why? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Where is it manifest? It's manifest in them. Man looks at creation. He can see the, God's uh, handiwork. He can see uh, you know, the judgments that God has performed on the earth. He can look at his own mind and his own heart and see that God has revealed himself to all of mankind, that there is a God, that there is somebody who created him and has a will for them. They can look at that. And that's why they're condemned. <clears throat> because God hath showed it unto them. God has made himself apparent. God has revealed himself. I mean, that's the purpose of God's revelation. Go over to Romans chapter number eight. Romans chapter number eight. You know, God did all this to bear witness of himself. God's not playing some cosmic game of hide and seek with mankind. I'm over here. No, I'm over here now. You know, God has, has chosen to reveal himself, and we'll see why. He wants to reveal himself to, you know, bear witness of himself. That's, that's what all this is, is, is showing us. Creation, our conscience, the judgments, all of this, it bears witness of himself. And not only that, this, you know, without even God even trying, just the fact that he's revealed himself to man, that is what condemns man. In turn, it condemns mankind. And that's what we read in Romans chapter 1. They knew God, and they glorified him not as God. God manifests these things in them, and they chose not to acknowledge him. <clears throat> but here's the thing, you know, God has revealed himself to all mankind. But in spite of that fact, that is not enough to get, does that mean everybody's saved? No, of course not. Few there are that be saved. This, this, the fact is that God has revealed himself to all mankind, but that general revelation of God is not enough to save mankind. Because there's really two types of revelation. Okay, there's, You have the general revelation where God has just manifest himself to all of mankind, where people can just look at creation, look at their hearts, look at all these things, and just say, there is a God. God exists. And who is he? And then they can begin to seek if they want and feel after him. But then there's the special revelation where God you know, directly uh, reveals himself to men to a man, to individuals, to groups of people. But the general revelation that God, where he reveals himself to all mankind, that is inadequate for salvation. That's not going to get anybody saved. That's why I don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, arguing uh, creation with people, because it's inadequate to get people saved. It might get them thinking, it might get the wheels turning, or it might just end up just being a long debate that's highly ineffective. <clears throat> You know, that's not enough to get somebody saved. Eventually, they have to end up just putting their faith in, in the Word of God. <clears throat> Why is that? Why is not, you know, you would think, well, that should be enough. Why can't people just look at creation? Why can't people just look in their own hearts, see the judgments of God, and just say, there is a God, and His name is Jesus, and I believe on Him and get saved? Well, a large part of that is because of the fact that, you know, this creation that God has uh, revealed Himself through is marred by sin. Right? We all know the story in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam ate of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, he, the ground was cursed. He said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. So it doesn't have uh, you know, that original glory that it had. It's cursed. That's why people look at creation. They go, you know, explain, explain mosquitoes. You know, he, when he, when he uh, cursed it, you know, he, cur he said it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. We know a little something about that here in Arizona. But all the thorns and thistles, right? We step on a big patch of, you know, those, what are they called? Satanic devil horns or whatever they are. Those little tiny spike ones. Are they, is it devil horns or something like that? I don't know. It's like a real appropriate name, though. We step on those, and I've got, I mean, I don't know how many times I've done it solely. I've done it a few times. You just step on that, and then it's just like, ah! You got to take your shoe off and pull all those things out. It's like, why did God make this? You know, and there's probably, if we studied it all, and we went into all of it, you know, and, and followed it through and did all the science behind it, there's probably a purpose behind all of it. But when man looks at creation in general, they'll say, well, why did God make poisonous frogs? Why did God make, you know, venomous animals? Why are there thorns? It doesn't make any sense. 
Well, God made them, but man fell, and then the creation was cursed. Again, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. It's just showing us that God has cursed this earth. It's marred by sin. So the general revelation to man is not enough to save him. Because the creation is imperfect, because it is in bondage, but also because of the fact that man himself is blinded by sin. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. You know, man is spiritually blind. He can't, he can't uh, look at creation and discern all this. It doesn't make any sense to him. They can't understand it. So because the general revelation of God uh, through creation, through history, through conscience, is inadequate to save man. Okay, it's inadequate. God has, you know, God didn't just say, well, you know, I tried. You know, I, I gave him all that. And, and it, you know, like, God has gone to great lengths to make sure that man knows who he is. God has manifested himself through special revelation. Okay, let's go over to 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, 2 Samuel chapter number 8. And what is special revelation? So general revelation, again, is just God revealing himself to all of mankind. But special revelation, whereas God, you know, he doesn't use creation as a, as a witness of himself, where he actually reveals himself directly to man. There's no middleman. There's no intermediary. He just reveals himself directly to mankind. And there's several different examples of this throughout Scripture. We'll, we'll move through them very quickly. But one of, them, uh, one of the ways which God reveals himself through special revelation would be dreams. You know, and you see this throughout uh, the Bible. We could talk about, you know, Joseph's dream, where he dreamed about how, you know, the other sheaves, which represented his brothers, were going to bow down to him. Like talk, it was uh, God showing him that he was going to be a ruler in Egypt when he didn't understand it all at the time. Then he had the other dream where the sun and the, and the moon and the stars bowed down to him, Right? Uh, he had the dream. He had the dreams of the butler. Remember when he was in prison, the butler and the baker come in there, and they and he wants he has to inter, in, interpret their dreams. That it was God showing them it was going to happen, and it comes to pass. Then you have even Pharaoh's dream, right, where he has the dream of the the, the kind, fat fleshed, and, and and the other the skinny ones, and the one devours the other, and he says to them, you know, that God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do, and how did he do that through a dream? So that's one way that God has used special revelation to reveal himself to man. And he revealed himself to Pharaoh. Then there's the example of not only dreams, but visions. Okay, and you say, well, isn't that the same thing? Well, a vision differs from a dream in the fact that a vision is something that happens while you're still awake. You think about Daniel's vision, right? Where he's by the river. It says in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Dan me, Daniel, uh, after which appeared unto me at the first. And if you read that story, that's like during the day. Like he's out sitting by a river and this vision comes upon him. You know, this isn't where he laid down like Pharaoh did and had a dream or Joseph. <clears throat> we could think about, you know, Peter's vision in Acts. It says where he went up on the roof, right? And it says he fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened. So this is a vision where God is revealing himself in a special way directly to man. Okay, it's a special revelation. Then we could talk about Urim and Thummim, which is you know, something that, that pertained to the priesthood. It was a part of the, 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 the garments that they wore, the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim. And you know, that's a whole other series, that's a whole other uh, sermon right there. But if you remember, it's 1 Samuel chapter 28, when Saul inquired of the Lord, uh, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So that was another, these are just different ways in which God has revealed himself to mankind. Uh, not, at, not in general, but specifically to individuals and through a special revelation. Uh, <clears throat> we in, did I have you go to Numbers? I don't think I did. Go to Numbers. That's where you should have gone. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. This is one of probably, um, you know, my more favorite uh, examples of this. You know, God's special revelation uh, before we get to Numbers, you know, you could also think about the audible voice that Samuel heard. Remember that? Samuel, Samuel, he thought it was Eli talking. That was God revealing him. He doesn't do that to everybody. That's a special revelation that God gave at certain times to certain people. But he also uses animals. And this is kind of an interesting one, right? N Numbers chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 27. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. So remember, Balaam was going to prophesy against Israel. He got hired. 
and he's on the way there, and God's trying to stop him. And it says, when the ass of the, uh, uh, saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. You know, he got a flat tire. And, you know, he lost his temper. And he smote the ass with a staff. So, I mean, the guy's just losing his cool. He gets off, and he just starts smacking this, this animal, this ass with a, with a staff. This is just laying down, right? It just sees, the, it sees it and just says, it sees the angel and just, it just sits down, right? And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast sent me this three times? Every time I read this, it, it makes me chuckle. Because you can just picture the situation. He's like, I'm going to go prophesy. I'm going to go get all, you know, the, all this money. I'm going to be, you know, get me made rich. I'm going to be given honor. And all of a sudden, the ass just sits down. And he starts beating it. And the ass turns and starts to talk to him. This is God speaking. This is a special revelation. Look, this is, don't go home and expect your cat or your dog to do this. Okay? This is what special revelation is. It's, a very, it's unique. It's different. It's, it's often it's, it's not something that happens consistently. And it's not anything that goes on anymore. I don't believe God is speaking us anymore through dreams or visions. I don't believe he's giving us Urim and Thummim. I don't think he's going to speak to you through your house cat, okay, no matter how much you beat it. You know, you're going to go home and squirt your cat with a bottle and it's going to say, why hast thou done this to me? You know, <laughs> what have I done unto thee, you know, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And then verse 29 is probably the most humorous part. And Balaam said unto the ass, I mean, the fact that he actually doesn't, like, did it even register with him that my, my, my ass is talking to me? This animal is speaking to me? And he's just like, starts talking back to it. Because thou hast mocked me, he says. Why, I'll tell you why I'm beating you. It wasn't like, whoa, you know? I don't know if, I mean, and this wasn't probably the most, most charming animal. It wasn't like Mr. Ed or something like that. You know, the talking horse. He said, I would, there were a sword in my hand, and for now I would kill thee. And the ass said again unto Balaam, he starts talking again, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Uh, was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. So he just, he's having this conversation. Now people say, you know, like, well, what, how did that ass talk? Like, what, what did, I don't think this was like that animal's own personal cognition, okay? <laughs> I think this was the Lord speaking through it. You know, this was a special revelation of God. This wasn't, you know, the, the ass finally could move its tongue and speak you know, and be understood so it's going to express the way it felt finally. You know, these weren't the, this wasn't the internal monologue of the, of the ass finally being, you know, spoken. I believe this was God speaking through it, you know, and showing, uh, you know, Balaam how crazy uh, he, he was. <laughs> anyway, it's a funny story, but that is one of the special revelations that you see God do throughout Scripture. Uh, we have, you know, the example of angels, okay? I'm almost done with this part of it, but angels... We could go to Luke 1 where the angel Gabriel shows up to Zacharias and to Mary, right? Uh, the heavenly host that shows up uh, to the shepherds, right? These are all special things. The angels of revelation. You know, that's something that God's going to do, a special thing that God's going to do at the end of the world. When God's pouring out his wrath, you know, he, he, there's going to be the angels that fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. These are special revelations of God to man. Now, all these, you know, these various forms of spe special revelation, you know, they're significant to those uh, who they came upon. You know, they're special to them. They're significant to them. It was significant to Joseph that he had those dreams, right? They're, they're not really, those aren't specifically significant to us. You know, the, the things that uh, the ass said to Balaam don't really pertain to us. You know, it's a story that we read. So they are similar to God's general, general revelation in that they are insufficient to save lost man. Okay? Now, the special revelation that is able to save man's soul is, the, uh, is the, the, the revelation that came through Jesus Christ in the Bible. Right? And Jesus Christ is a special revelation of God to man. And what I'm trying to get across this morning is that's how far God has gone to manifest himself to mankind. You know, he didn't just make creation. He didn't just put the law of God in our hearts. He didn't just execute judgment on the earth for us to look at and look at the curse and look at all these other things. You know, he didn't give us <clears throat> all these different stories of, uh, you know, these, these different revelations through people, uh, you know, through these different special revelations. That's not going to happen to us today. You know, we might want that, but you know what's far greater than that is the fact that Jesus Christ has manifest himself unto man. 
He is the completion of that revelation, of God's special revelation. So God revealed himself by coming directly to man and dwelling with him. And we know the scriptures. We know 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on the Gentiles, believed on the world, and what? Received up into glory. That's God that was manifest in the flesh. You know, that's a great verse to, to, to show people that doubt the deity of Christ. You know, the Mormons might say, oh, that was, you know, the father when he came down and, you know, had relations with Mary. That's what they believe, okay? But, you know, the, the rest of that doesn't, you can't really apply that to him because it says that he was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. Okay, it's specifically about Christ. That's, who else is that referring to if not Christ? And what does it say? That God was manifest in the flesh. You know, Jesus Christ is that special revelation to all mankind, to all of us. That's how far God has gone to reveal himself to man. Again, God wants man to be saved. The Bible says in John 1.14, the word was made flesh and we beheld and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only be glory of the, uh, of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word was made flesh, Jesus Christ. That's God's special revelation. Go over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. You know, God wants man to be saved. God wants man to know who he is. And God has just gone to all these great lengths through creation, through all these things to reveal himself unto mankind. You know, we would look at that and think, well, that's enough. I mean, what more does God have to do? But you know what? Those things aren't sufficient. The creation is not sufficient to get man saved and to bring him to Christ. Uh, you know, the judgments, even his own conscience is not enough to bring man to Christ. Now, all those things can play a part and causing man to, 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 to come to Christ. But ultimately, to come to Christ, you need the Bible. You need the Word of God to come to Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 6, look at verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. That's the will of God, that they would see uh, the Son. You know, now, obviously, Christ isn't going to come down here today and reveal himself physically like he did uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, like he did with the apostles and the disciples. That's not going to happen. You know, but we are the ones that are going to go out and show people Christ. We not, now, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled unto God. You know, we're the ones that are going to go and actually show people Christ through the word of God. You know, God, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. You know, God has spoken unto the fathers in times past by the prophets. But how has he spoken to us today? It says in verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us, that's me and you, that's everybody, by his Son. So I want a sign from God. Well, you got one. It's called the Bible. You got one. It's called Jesus Christ having come here and preached and manifesting himself to the world whom he appeared an heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God to man. That is the pinnacle. That's the crown of that revelation. <clears throat> However, his final revelation to man, the, final, the last revelation that he has made thus far, is in the scripture itself. You know, the Bible itself is God's revelation to man. And that's what we believe about the scriptures. Jesus said in John 5, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So Jesus Christ, yeah, he is, he revealed him, he is the revelation of God to man, but it's now it's the scriptures that, that testify of him. That, that's what we use to reveal Christ, to reveal God to people today. <clears throat> the Bible itself. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> You know, a lot of these other things, they're not sufficient. They're not sufficient for salvation, but you know what is, is the Word of God. The Word of God is what's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and is divide, can divide asunder, you know, to the, boins of, the, 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 the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. It's the Word of God that's going to do that for people. It's not a fossil. It's not a creation seminar. You know, it's the Word of God that's going to get people saved, ultimately. That is the ultimate revelation that God has given us, the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So the knowledge of Him, of Jesus Christ, is, the, is God's divine power. That knowledge, right? That's what it says there. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of Christ, whereby are given unto us exceeding precious, great and precious promises. How do we receive these great and precious promises? Whereby do we receive them? How are they given to us? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of Christ, through the acknowledging of Christ, through knowing Jesus, you know, we are given exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, that you might be saved. That's God's revelation to man, is through Christ, and that's how we are saved. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the Bible is what is sufficient for salvation day. That's not to say that, you know, God, that, you know, that's, that God just did the bare minimum in giving us the Bible. God did just enough to get man saved. No, God has been revealing himself since creation. God has revealed himself through creation. God has manifested himself unto mankind in all these different ways. But ultimately, the only one that's, that's going to you know, seal the deal for man and him getting saved is through the Bible, through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It's the law of the Lord that converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You know, which means this is that the Bible is needed for salvation. You, you do need the Bible to get people saved. You can't just, you know reason with people into salvation. You actually, at some point, you have to get the, the Bible out and start to read it to, and tell them what it says and show them that they're a sinner, show them that God loves them, show them that, that salvation's a gift, that it's eternal, that you can't lose it, that it's by faith. You have to show these, these, them these things from the Scripture. <clears throat> and it has to be that way. You know, it has to be that way because of the fact, you know, why are these other things insufficient? Because of sin. You know, it's our, our iniquities have separated us from God. Our sins have hid his face from us, right? And because of the fact that God is holy, we need some kind of an intermediator uh, to, to help us, right? We need that mediator, which is Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're going to close there, but Deuteronomy chapter 29. You know, God doesn't have pleasure in wickedness. He, he, evil's not going to dwell with him, the Bible says in Psalms. You know, he's of pure eyes than to behold evil. You know, so God, in a way, has had to hide himself from man just because of the fact that man is sinful. You know, God can't just uh, dwell with iniquity. But that doesn't mean God hasn't tried to reach out for, to man. That God hasn't tried to, you know, manifest himself to mankind through all these different ways. <clears throat> you know, and the, here's the thing. God has done this not just because he's obligated. You say, well, God's obligated to do it. God has to reveal himself. No, he doesn't. God could have just, you know, le left Adam and Eve in the garden and just, you know, just started, you know what, from there on forward, everyone can just go to hell. And he would have been perfectly just in doing that. And think about that. God didn't have to reveal himself to man. <clears throat> you know, he wasn't obligated he didn't owe us something. The only reason he did that is because he loves us. That's the love of God towards man. The fact that he has chosen to reveal himself, that he has chosen to uh, show man how he can be saved through Christ because of the love of God. <clears throat> you know, Deuteronomy chapter 29, look at verse 29. The Bible says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. The secret things belong unto the word, the Lord our God. You know, there's some things about God we're never going to understand, we're never going to know. There's some things that God has chosen not to reveal unto himself. You know, and people, they seem to get, sometimes they get so obsessed with those things. Secret things, things that God has, you know, is not going to reveal. The, the secret things belong unto him. He says, you're not going to know any of it. And people want to pry into all that. They want to try and figure out, they want to sit there and you know, and just wonder about and think about and hypothesize about all these, you know, the secret things. And they get so caught up in that. And when we do that, sometimes I think we miss what God has revealed. It says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, 
but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. And the things which God has revealed, they belong to us. Those are the things we should concern ourselves with. We should concern about, well, what about this about God? Well, what about that about God? Well, what, what do you know about God? Maybe we should just focus on that. Maybe we should just focus on the things that God has revealed unto us through his word. All the things that do pertain unto life and to godliness. Those are the things we should concern ourselves. You know, God's, that's what God has given us. That's what's important, the things which belong unto us and to our children forever. And that's what it says there at the end, right? Why has God revealed all this to us? Why has God given us these things? That we may do the words of this law. So we shouldn't get so obsessed about the things that we don't know, the things that God hasn't revealed unto us, and, and, you know, and, and, and fail to not do the things that are written in this law. These are the things we should concern ourselves. That's why God's given them to us, so that we can do all the things that are written in the law. While the various means of God's revelation, you know, they're intriguing, aren't they? There's some things that we would really, we wonder about. At least I do. Sometimes I sit there and I think about, you know, different things. Uh, yea, the deep things of God, right? The mysteries of God. But you know what? That's not what's going to help me live a good Christian life. That's not what's going to make my life profitable here on earth. That's how it's going to help me, you know, raise a godly family. That's how it's going to help me to win souls. Just wondering about all the things which have not been revealed, all the secret things that belong unto God. Those aren't the things that are going to help me. They're intriguing, you know what, as intriguing as they are, they cannot compare to the revelation that is given us in the Bible. You know, we shouldn't take that for granted. That's really what I'm trying to get across this morning, is to de- for, so for people to develop an appreciation for what they hold in their hands in the Bible. God's revelation to mankind. You know, we want to look at all these other things and be in awe of them. Oh, the Grand Canyon, wow. Yeah, it's breathtaking. Wow, that was, this is all underwater. Yeah, it's intriguing to think about all the things that God has done in the past, but none of those things can save you. None of those things are going to help you live for the Lord, but this is right here. This is the power of God and the salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what God has given to us. This, is, this isn't secret. These are the things that God has given unto us and to our children forever. You know, the word of God is going to remain forever. The creation, it's all going to fade away. You know, all these other testimonies, all these th- other things that God has revealed himself through, they're all going to go away. But this is going to, the word of our God shall stand forever. You know, th- this is what we should concern ourselves with. You know, all these other things, they might be intriguing, but they cannot compare to the revelation that is given to us in the Bible. It's an eternal revelation. You know, it's given, and why is it given unto us? So that we can know the very will of God. Let's go ahead and pray.